Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Off the Hill, the ANU's weekly look at what's been happening in this, this 2016 federal election campaign, and it's the last week of the campaign, and we're finally here. <laughs> Joining me today, as always, I've got Dr. Andrew Hughes, political marketing expert, and with me on my left, I've got Maria Teflaga, who is an expert on uh, opposition parties and, and how they make policy particularly in Australia. So we've got a lot to talk about today. We're going to have a look back on the campaign that was and then hopefully give you a few tips about what to look for on Saturday night. Okay, let's start. I have been amazed this week to see how quickly after Brexit, and we touched on Brexit mm. last week, um, how quickly the Liberals have pivoted to this message of stability afterwards. It was 24 hours and they've gone from jobs and growth, jobs and growth. Nope, uncertain times. I, to be honest, did not think voters in Australia would care about Brexit. My gut feel is that they've had polling overnight. You'd know more about this kind of thing. Yep. I reckon they've tested this over, yep. th over Friday <coughs> night last week and they've found, okay, voters are worried. We need to talk about stability. It's almost comical. It's almost caric yeah. like caricature kind of stuff. Yeah. The extent to which they're emphasising stability now. They've yep. literally picked up this message of, uh, of stay on message. I don't know. I think they've been talking about stability for the entire campaign. If it's not, don't vote for minor parties, the greening of Labor, don't change horses in mis midstream. I think this is just the sort of cherry on top for them. Reminds everyone about economic management and that we're a stable pair of hands. Don't trust the irresponsible Labor Party. That was so nuanced, though. <laughs> <laughs> was it? <laughs> well, <laughs> compared to what it is now, right? It's... But it's the last couple of days. I guess they've got nothing else There's to no lose. There's no time for nuance. There's no time for nuance. And they're yeah. certainly not this even feigning nuance, this is it. right? Yeah. Why? But why? That's the thing. It's, we're in the blackout period too. Now you can really let all the key words from, from the leaders come out, like we saw today in the press club from um, Malcolm Turnbull. Yep. And how he really spoke hard on that Brexit message. Yep. You know, that's For once in the campaign, we're suddenly hearing fear from the coalition. Where it's been positive all the way through. Remember, we're in the blackout period. You can't run an ad on this. So what they have to do instead is mm. get you to imagine the fear. And okay. I think that's been a really p key part of the I last few days. I wouldn't have thought about that and y you've enlightened me, Andrew. <laughs> I'll give you that. Hang on, I should, uh, <laughs> I'm having a heart attack. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll mark this moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is the picture that they've tried to present on all of the soft news they've done this week yeah. too, right? Yeah. Kitchen cabinet, the press yeah. club today. Look, and, and uh, hats off to the coalition. I'm going to say that right now. For my money, they've run the best campaign out of all the parties, you know, this election. They really have. It's been strong all the way through. So what do you think are their specific strengths and weaknesses? Consistently positive. They haven't engaged Labor on Labor's um, areas of brand mm. strengths, dare I say it as a marketer, but they haven't really said anything to give Labor that traction they've been looking for, momentum they've been looking for. They haven't been sucked into a fight. Some figures I did yesterday yep. looked at, um, they've done 14 negative ads this campaign, but 27 positive, the coalition. Yep. Uh, whereas the Labor Party have done 27 um, positive and 21 negative. So it's, you know, that's a high number, right? It's a that lot is of, That's a lot of, mm. a lot of ads. Weaknesses? Yeah, weaknesses um, for the coalition. Yep. Um, I think they've missed the opportunity to put some killer blows on Labor in a couple key areas where they're strong mm. on, for example, national security, for example, border control, for example, um, the economy. They could have gone really hard there. And I think in some ways they've given a bit more space on the far right there for those independent parties and minor parties to come in and sort of circle around those okay. areas. So we'll see how that plays out after the election. Yeah, I think we will. Okay, now turning to the ALP. And I have been very critical of the ALP throughout these throughout these videos, I think, um, that they haven't they haven't yeah. had a vision either. It's just been yeah. this sort of small target, yeah. almost like Shorten's got the, you know, a wet blanket and he's just going to throw it over everything as much as he possibly can to the yeah. extent that there's been a positive vision. It's been a vague idea about Medicare because, as I've explained, as long as voters think about health, as long as they think that's the most important issue, they think that the ALP is better placed to govern in yep. the area of health. Yep. Maria, oh. you've published a, uh, an opinion piece today that totally disagrees with me, and I want you to justify it. Well, well, I would say that it's a matter of degrees. I would say that the, the Labor Party has run a bigger target campaign than we have seen for many a year. Was it Rudd the ultimate big target, though? No, I mean, his whole election was um, on a campaign of I'm everything you like about John Howard um, and also some new stuff on the side. Whereas, I mean, I think for Labor, you know, to go to a campaign 
advocating for changes to negative gearing, to basically back in a carbon tax, to um, advocate spending on a much larger scale. You know, they're basically arguing for greater intervention by the state into people's lives. Labor like, values. Labor values, absolutely. And they've given us a lot more detail and taken a lot more risks than oppositions have in the last couple of elections. Again, you know, going to the polls with a, with a policy to change negative gearing, a giant shibboleth mm. and bugbear mm. that has been in the too hard basket for 30 years. I'd say that's a little bit brave. Is it just a populist reaction though? housing uh, affordability concerns? No, because I think that negative gearing um, can be problematic across their own base as well as okay. the opposition's base. Yeah, and I think you're probably yeah. right. There's, it's, there's the point. aspiration factor there. convinced me somewhat. <sighs> yes! <laughs> I'm really harsh today. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the last week of the campaign, you said. Uh, yep, Andrew, what do you think about the ALP's campaign? You, look, um, disappointed from the word go because I, I would have thought that um, having started the campaign saying we've got 100 positive policies, why not then run a positive message after that saying, look, this is linked into our 100 positive policies, as it were. Is the bus positive? <laughs> Maria, what do you think have been the strengths and weaknesses of the ALP campaign? Well, I think for the ALP, it's reminding everyone about why they may have ever voted Labor in the past. So it's a yeah. return to brand, to use Andrew's language. I know. Yes. Oh, yes. oh. By this day is epic in my book. <laughs> epic. <laughs> But yeah, you know, it's reminding everyone of, you know, labour values, putting people first, uh, spending measures, that's what they do best. So, yep. yeah. The weaknesses? Who trusts them to add it all up? I think they've yeah. struggled on the economic credibility front. And I think that's the problem for But labor. they always do. They always that's do. That's an eternal labour problem. That is their eternal problem. So. Well, let's talk about costings. Yeah. I know none of us probably want to. <laughs> But Listeners probably important. don't really want us to, but it's really important, right? Yeah. Both parties have released their costings in the last week. Yep. They've just thrown them out yep. while everyone's looking somewhere else. I've got two questions for both of you. Why do they do it? And when they do it, why do they make them so precise? It's trying to prove that they're good at economic management. They're trying to say, look, it we've gone work. to that level of degree. Of course it doesn't. Because <laughs> who's that involved with economic policy in the first place? Economists. All, all we want. Yeah, but they are. <laughs> but true. Yes, hats off to the economists in the room. Um, hey, is there any? It's not. No, no. <laughs> they're not here at the moment. Yeah. They're somewhere else. Um, but looking at how they've um, done their costings, you think, okay, this should be a key part of your, your strength, right? Your brand strength, if you're the coalition, is, hey, we do the economy. That's what we do. But all they've done here is the minimum That's necessary, That's it. And, right? and Malcolm Turnbull uh, comes out today, and it's on Kitchen Cabinet, for those people who haven't seen it yet, where he, he talks about the fact he regrets how he put all everything on the table when it came to tax reform because it made him seem like he wasn't organised and he mm. wasn't in control. It's like going, oh, hang on, I can't do it. I'm just the Prime Minister. You guys decide what it should be. And they had to get that credibility back somehow and Labor missed that chance to really go after them on that. And the costings certainly haven't helped. But so why so precise? What? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it raises important implications. Like, what's the point of having policy debates at all? Yeah. But, you know, why so precise? Well, I mean, as I understand it, we've sort of gotten into it we, we'd like historically gotten into a situation where we um, predict down to point figures mm. whereas you know in other countries they predict within ranges and so we have yeah. silly debates about um, whether or not forecastings are out by what in most places is considered the margin of error yeah, yeah. so you know, there is a really important discussion to be had there like you know, what are we actually trying to achieve with costings and maybe we could have a, a better more sophisticated debate if we didn't focus on Exactly how wrong is this yep. forecast going to be? I mean, that would, yeah. I mean, a really comprehensive debate would also have to include, you know, the fundamentals of economic modelling. Yep. Yep. The fact is, most people don't understand it. Yep. Yep. Um, it's an incredibly, I mean, it's a social science. It's not a, a hard science. Yep. And look across the Tasman, John Key, um, earlier this year, um, sorry, before he did the last election, he, he announced his budget and put it up for a discussion. So before it being put up in the parliament, mm, okay. he said, this is up for discussion how we should run the country. He's done it's some cool things. That's right. I love that. My final thoughts, two seats to watch. Yep. Um, Lindsay yep. and Ina Monero. They're my seats okay. I put down. Lindsay is... You haven't gone... That's completely safe. I the know. The bellwether and the ultimate Western Sydney seat. Yeah, but well, come on. For? Come on. Bellwether, really? I think Peter Hendy is in trouble. Yep. I really think that bellwether Agreed. status is gone. Um, and, and look, if you're looking for a prediction, I'm, I'm happy to give one. Turnbull just, why not? Um, but oh, the more interesting yeah. part of the campaign, I think, on Saturday night is how the sentence could play out. We've yep. all talked about the Xenophon effect. Finally, we see how people have voted on that 
exact factor. Whether he can get up in the lower house, we can, whether he can get up in the Senate, I think all that talk ends come Saturday night when we start to see the results come through. We're going to see some wacky Senate. We are. We are. Yeah. Taffers? South Australia. What's going to happen in South Australia with the Xenophon effect? The, the reality is is that several several seats are in trouble for both the government and Mayo, for example, for the government, um, Adelaide for, for Labor. And I don't think anyone really knows how the preference flows are going to work from that. Mm. So that'll be fun. In the lower house. In the lower house. If we see Xenophon, Xenophon candidates in the lower house. What's going to happen? I think we should look for results in Batman. Mm -hmm. See if David Feeney no, no, leaves, no, no, his seat no, 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 no. leaves, yeah. leaves his seat to the Greens. <laughs> uh, Melbourne Ports is always really interesting. The the ALP's got a sort Coolest of tenuous seat, hold on that. It's a good Ports. name for a seat. Yeah. Um, where I'm from, at the Outer East, Latrobe, Bruce, always mm -hmm. interesting. We don't give these seats much attention nationally, right. but True. they can, they can, you know, they can win government. Yeah. So be looking on the outskirts of Victoria. Outskirts of Melbourne is my prediction. Thanks again for watching. We're going to return on Monday for a, hopefully a fairly brief wrap up of the election results, although that might depend on what exactly happens on Saturday night. Keep posted to our uh, Twitter feed, our Facebook and the website to uh, find out exact details of that. And we'll see you then.